something that's unfortunately been a rarity lately. I have quite a few announcements, um, several concerns and joys. Uh, first of all, uh, Tammy Muhandro's mother had surgery last week. Uh, she is now back at her assisted living at Silver Creek, uh, but prayers for her continued recovery would be appreciated. And uh, former associate pastor Lori Clinging's husband, Clinging's uh, husband passed away last night. We do not have any information at this time on uh, service arrangements. Uh, so we'll get that out when we have that information. And uh, John David Roberts, uh, the grandfather of P. Kelly Shepard, passed away last Tuesday in Dardanelle, Arkansas. He was a lifelong member of Gum Springs Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Arkansas, and he was 102 years old. So um, his service is going to be Monday morning in Dardanelle. He was the father of Joyce Shepherd, P. Kelly's mother, P. Kelly's grandfather, great grandfather to Anna, Allie, and Sarah. And for two days, he was the great, great grandfather of Brody James Leak, born to Anna uh, on Tuesday, 20 inches long, almost eight pounds, and in Midland, Tennessee. So Kelly and Kelly are now grandparents for the first time. So good news for all of you. Um, announcements. There's no youth group tonight. Paul will be leaving for a special event for his father. And um, today is this Sunday lunch. So immediately after the service, we'll be going. Anyone who uh, needs assistance with uh, walking should go ahead and leave maybe during the last hymn so that they can get to, to the food. <laughs> and not, not have to stand around in the line. Uh, if you did not bring anything, I'm sure there's plenty of food. There always is. So please, everyone, stay for, this, for the uh, fifth Sunday lunch. Uh, cleaning supplies are needed for the Olive Branch Food Bank. So uh, please bring cleaning supplies to help stock the food bank. Communion is next Sunday, and also next Sunday, the Congregational Care Ministry team will meet at 2 p.m., and uh, they are updating the contact info for the church. Uh, there's a, uh, we're trying to, to get out more information to people easier, so uh, you should have been contacted by someone from the care team. Uh, if you haven't been, uh, you need to be sure that the church has your information. They need your email address, uh, both cell phone and home phone, if you still have a home phone. And also, most importantly, they need to know how you prefer to be contacted, whether it's through a phone call, a text message, or an email. So that's, that's very important that they have that information. Uh, so this is it's going to be a, a church-wide thing. We need to be able to get in touch with you and keep you informed. Uh, that's the way we stay together. So. That's, that's good to have. Um, Also from Paul, uh, and this has been a request, so uh, copies of his sermon are now available. If you want to read along during this sermon, uh, feel free.
continue to go out and get one when we have our um, passing of the peace so that you can do that. And, or if you want one to take home with you, be sure and pick one up after the service. If there are more copies needed, Paul said he would be very happy to make more copies available. Easter plans. Next month is April, starting tomorrow. So, uh, things to be aware of. April 13th, Saturday, is our Easter egg hunt. If you haven't brought candy to fill the Easter eggs for the kids, please do so as soon as possible. Uh, the following, the Sunday, the day after the Easter egg hunt, Sunday the 14th is Palm Sunday. The 18th Thursday is our Monday Thursday service at 7 p.m. Communion will be served then, so please plan to attend. On Saturday the 20th is Allie and Skyler's wedding at 4 p.m. On Sunday the 21st, <coughs> is a busy morning. We'll have sunrise service in the prayer garden at 7.30, and we thank all members who came uh, to, to help prepare the prayer garden for that service and also for the wedding, because uh, that's where it should be held, wedding weather permitting. Uh, so, sunrise service at 7.30, followed by breakfast at 8.30, followed by Sunday school at 9.30. Different time for Sunday school on Easter Sunday, 9.30, because uh, then we'll have a greeting time at 10.30, and then the traditional service will begin at 11, as usual. Any other announcements? That, yes, Lynn. Verses and courses are lifted to your highest heavens. Repent, for the kingdom of God has drawn near. Along this Lenten journey, O Lord, you open our eyes to the ways your Spirit calls us to move, change, and grow. In this time together, open our eyes and show us where your Spirit is moving. Strengthen us, proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of God has drawn near. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let, Let us, us worship, worship God. God. Please remain standing for our hymn, We God Us Again. <laughs>
join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O oh God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. In the season of Lent, we remember how deeply sinful we are, and yet the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ is that no amount of sinfulness can keep us from God. Rejoice, for our God saves even though we don't deserve salvation. And repent, for the kingdom of God has drawn near. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we will have a hymn of celebration.
Jeff, hey, do we have any Joe's Eyeball celebrations? Maybe now. Before the joy, I just learned another prayer request that we need. Um, some of you already may know, but we need to be in prayer for Cookie Piles. She had a tumble and a pass out in the yard, I heard this week, and ended up in the doctor's office and um, not able to drive for a little while. So be mindful of that and give her a call to check on her. Um, my joy is yesterday, Larry and I got to be in Jackson, Tennessee, or Tennessee, Jackson, Mississippi, and we got to have lunch with Matt and Caitlin Cutts, that's Ricky's oldest son. And um, if you hadn't seen it on Facebook, they are expecting, and they're far enough along to know that it is a boy. So they are so excited, and um, I think the due date is sometime August is what we're thinking. But anyway, just wanted to share that joy. I got a couple of maybe three or four thank you Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you Bible study class. I know Bible study class. We were such a class of we were overjoyed at money. Well, that's always a good thing. Well, he looked over at me and said, uh, what can we do to help build in the ground? I said, one thing we need is one good lot of board instead of two or three Bad <laughs> So he said he thought we could, he could take care of that. So since he was the treasurer of the Bible study class, he asked us and him to go lawnmower shopping Friday. So we did look for one lawnmower. But after finding out the place we was at, they had on sale. And of course, we've got a little bit of Jew in him. He wanted to go to the bank and see if we couldn't get a mower. So he did. He went up there. And uh, snowballed his parents in, he gave us 10 more percent off the lawnmower. He said, well, since you're going to do that, we're just going to buy two lawnmowers. So I just want to thank the Bible study class from the uh, building and ground. Uh, Bill back here is uh, on head of building and ground, and all the other men on call them names because I do a lease of them out. But uh, we just want to thank the Bible study class for that, and that really helped us out. Uh, there will be no youth group this evening because um, I am going to Faith Cumberland Presbyterian Church uh, for my dad's installation service as their pastor. So technically, he was hired in August, but apparently he hasn't been their pastor for eight months or whatever. But um, So I will be preaching that service at 6 o'clock. So if you want to just come support another CP church, or uh, if you got nothing better to do on a Sunday evening, then come on to Faith, CP, and Barbara. Uh, we're going to have a good time celebrating uh, his new ministry at the Faith Church. So, 6 o'clock. Let's now give our tithes and offerings.
Almighty God, you are so good to us. You bless us with gifts beyond measure, more than we could ever understand or properly thank you for. And yet, God, we return just a small portion of these gifts back to you. We ask that you take them, that you bless them, and that you multiply them for the glory of your kingdom. God, we ask that you bless the hands that give, that they may be your hands and feet in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. And as the children come up for children's time, I have one more announcement. That is, choir practice will be at 1 o'clock this afternoon, right after the potluck. So, for all those choir members, 1 o'clock right after lunch. So, let's have the children come up. conversation, God shared with him his plan. And what is that plan? What, what are we working up to? What comes after Lent? Easter, that's right. So God shared to Jesus what he had to go through. And all I could think about with all these losses and this young girl who, who, is, who is going to die, how in the world... Did Jesus deal with that? And when we deal with losses, have I lost your attention? <laughs> Are y'all looking at me? I know, they're cute, they're darling. <laughs> but I thought, how in the world can you deal with that? But you know what? We know the end of the story. We know, just like Jesus was told, that he was dying for a reason. And he would be resurrected. What is that reason that Jesus Christ had to die? Why? To save us from our sins. To save us. To save us. To save all of us. So what should we be doing if we are to mirror what, what Jesus was called to do? Now bring me my Bible. Let me get my scripture. In second chapter of Philipp uh, Philippians um, 5 through 8, in your lives you must think and act like Jesus Christ. Christ himself was like God in everything, but he did not think that being equal with God was something to be used 
for his own benefit, but he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born to be a man and became like a servant. Remember that part. He became like a servant. And when he was living as man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death on the Christ, on the cross. You know, God created us, not just one, right? He didn't create just one human, look around. He created all of us. And he created us so that we could serve him and serve alongside each other and serve each other in his name. So your job this week is to serve others. Because that's what Jesus had that discussion with God on that mountain about. What he was going to do for all of us. So I want you to look at your neighbors. I want you to look at your friends at school. I want you to look at your teachers. I even want you to look at your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles. I want you to look at these old people in this church. And I want you to think of somebody who has done something so nice for you. How about who in this church gets a hug when you walk in the door? Do you get a hug? Who hugs you? Who hugs you? Give me a name. Brinkley. Brinkley hugs you. Okay, well maybe you need to call Brinkley this week and tell her thank you for your hugs. Do you know who always hugs me? William Merrill. B.J. Halford. I always get a hug from them. Mama Jan. Maybe you need to pick up the phone and call somebody this week and say, I always appreciate your hugs. Maybe you need to pick up the phone or make a note this week and, and thank somebody for what they do for you. Maybe you see someone who just needs a door held open. This is serving like Christ. I'm sure Jesus held open a curtain or a doorway or cleared a doorway to help someone even through it. I'm sure he helped with the baby like Brinkley and hugged her. I'm sure Jesus did a lot of common things we don't even know that we do or don't do that we should do to be more like him. So this week of Lent, I want you to take that extra time you have, that time that you were being mindful of our Lent, I want you to take that 30 minutes or that hour and reach out and do something for someone else because we are called to be like Christ who is called to be like God and we are servants. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, I pray such a simple request of reaching out to someone Something that we think is so little and minute. But the fact that we spend our time and our mind even thinking about it and actually doing the task of taking it out and fulfilling it. Dear Father, the change that that will make and how it will bless the very person we are helping. We don't know what everyone's going through. We don't know if they're weak of losses or sad stories or maybe even joys have been. But dear Father, we need to slow down in this period of Lent, this time of reflection and looking at ourselves and opening ourselves up to listening to you, to be preparing for what we know Christ is called to go through. Help us, dear Father, to take time out of the lives you have blessed us with and serve you and serve our neighbors that are beside us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the churches in Corinth. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. Let's listen now for the word of God. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We pray with you. Almighty God, for the gift of your holy scriptures, we give you thanks. God. The ways you move and speak in our world continue to inspire us. And in this moment, as we come to your holy scriptures, we ask that you open our eyes. God, do a new thing in these new creations. Help us to see the ways you want us to grow and change and move. God, thank you for being with us in this moment. Bless us as we struggle and wrestle together to be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. I want to show you something. Uh, we're going to watch a little video real quick. Um, now, the man in this video is colorblind, and he receives a very special gift uh, that allows him to see color. And so we are going to, uh, with this man, watch uh, his first experience of color. And I hear there's a box inside of a box.
just for a minute, because it's winter. <laughs> Look at your kids' eyes, sweetie. They're so pretty. Too bad the sky's not a bright blue. Stop. It's all overcast. I know. We'll have that. Yeah. Her coat is very purple. <laughs> and Cora's coat. <laughs> that might be. I'm not colorblind, at least I don't think I am. So I literally can't even comprehend what it must be like to have all the beauty, all the color of God's creation rush into your brain at one time. The amazing thing is, we all have the opportunity to do this. Whether you know it or not, you have been invited to see the world differently than you ever have before. For Paul, the divide between the old way and the new way is simple. The old way is the way of the flesh, and the new way is the way of the spirit. Paul says we used to see things according to the flesh, or in the Greek, it's kata sarka. Everybody say kata sarka. That this new way that we are called to see the world is according to the spirit or katanuma. Everybody say katanuma. This brief section of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians begins, From now on, therefore, we know no one katasarka, even though we once knew Christ katasarka. So what is the difference between seeing the world kata sarka and seeing the world kata numa? What does it mean to see Christ kata sarka or kata numa? Well, I want to tell you a story. It's a great story, a story of underdogs overthrowing tyrants. It took place around 170 B.C. And it involves two brothers named Judas and Simon Maccabeus. Now the Maccabees lived in Israel when it was controlled by an empire called the Seleucid Empire, which was just one of the many different empires that conquered and controlled Israel in the time before the Roman Empire. Now the Seleucids were every bit as harsh and destructive as the Romans, and they specifically had it out for the Jews in Israel, like so many other people have over the years. So eventually, these brothers, Judas and Simon, have enough of their oppression, so they lead a revolt, a rebellion known as the Maccabean Revolt. And they overthrow the Seleucid Empire and lead to a few decades of relative peace in the country of Israel. Have you ever heard of the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah? Hanukkah is the religious holiday that celebrates the moment when the Maccabean forces reclaimed Jerusalem and restored the temple. 
They thought that they only had enough lamp oil to last one day, but the oil that they had lasted eight days. So to this day, Jews celebrate the eight days of Hanukkah. This story of the Maccabeans is a, a story of freedom fighters, of revolutionaries coming in to overthrow the foreign invaders. It's a story of people taking their land back and reclaiming what was theirs. Some might say this is a story of a Messiah. Actually, many people back then did claim that Judas Maccabeus was a Messiah. And notice that I intentionally said a Messiah and not the Messiah. In ancient Judaism, a Messiah was not really something that special. A Messiah was just someone who was called by God and sent to perform a specific task. So if you have a calling on your life in, in relation to this one job, you could be called a Messiah, like a, like a messenger of God. So anyone who was set apart by God to fulfill a particular task could be referred to as a Messiah. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet refers to King Cyrus of Persia as a Messiah, even though he's definitely not Jewish. He definitely didn't think he was doing the will of God, but Isaiah thought that he was. Because he liberated the Israelites from exile in Babylon. A Messiah is just someone who has a specific calling. There are so many Messiahs uh, in, in the centuries recorded in our Old Testament, but Jewish hope always promised that there would be one final capital M Messiah. One who would liberate the Jews, not just from the Romans or the Seleucids, but from all oppressors. One who would establish the Jewish kingdom exactly the way it should have been from the beginning. One who would make all the nations stream to Zion. One final leader one final task of God. And you know who many people believe to be this final Messiah? Judas Maccabeus. Judas and his brothers were heroes. They overthrew their oppressors. They destroyed idols. They killed non-believers. This is exactly what God wanted. Right? This is what it means to be the Messiah, to establish the Jewish kingdom once and for all, except the peace after the Maccabean revolt didn't really last that long. Eventually, the Seleucid Empire crumbled, and the new kids on the block called the Romans strolled into town. The Romans reconquered and re-oppressed the Jews, and Israel lived like it had for so many years. For the next hundred years. Even though Judas Maccabeus didn't live to see the war, he died in battle in the middle of the war. His memory lived on as the inspiration for the Jewish people, as a role model, as a Messiah. Therefore, when Rome came to town and started committing the same horrors as the last empire did, many people hoped for another Messiah, another Judas Maccabeus, another one to come and liberate the Jews from foreign invaders. But what did they get instead? Instead, we got a wandering, homeless, peasant preacher who spent a lot more time teaching than fighting, and a lot more time healing than revolting. Now, it's important to remember Think back long, long ago to that video we just watched. Imagine trying to look at this new Jesus with the old eyes of the people who told stories about the Maccabean revolt. Imagine that the hope that you have is for a new warrior king, and all you got was some peasant hippie from Nazareth. I mean, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Messiah? Come on, this guy couldn't save anything. He probably doesn't even know how to swing a sword. To see things katasarka is to project solutions of the flesh 
onto the, onto the problems that we have instead of projecting the solutions of the spirit. I mean, come on, it's just common sense, right? The human way to liberate an oppressed people is to just go there with an army and kill all the bad guys. And yet that's not what Jesus did. Jesus understood that liberation takes many forms, but the most important form comes not through war, but through love. An unconditional love, a radical love that led all the way to a cross. When we see Christ katasarka, we think, oh, come on, Jesus, you can't really mean for us to turn the other cheek. You really want us to hit them back, right? We have to defend ourselves. Or really, you really want us to give to all people who ask of us? What if they're just trying to take advantage of us? Or come on, Jesus, you really expect us to believe that lusting after someone is as good as adultery? Or that speaking mean words against someone is as good as murder? Come on, you can't really be serious. Jesus, you can't really expect us to love our enemies. To pray for those who persecute us. You see, when we look at the world with these old eyes, when we look at the world this way, we've already decided what's good. We've already decided what we're going to do, and then we come to God's scriptures to prove what we already believe. Not to learn anything new, but we are called to see things differently. In this season of Lent, we journey with Jesus to the cross, which means we, like Jesus, must prepare for Good Friday. That, we, that means we, like Jesus, must understand that true redemption, true reconciliation, comes not from fighting back, but from loving our enemies through their hatred. Jesus did that all the way to a cross. Sometimes we forget that we are called to take up our cross and follow him. When we are finally able to see that the driving force behind this whole thing is the love of God that came to earth in the form of Christ Jesus, then we begin to see the world not kata sarka, but kata numa. Everybody say kata numa. Then we see that God didn't send Jesus to earth to count our trespasses against us. No, Paul told us that. God sent Jesus to reconcile the world to himself through the radical love that can raise up the dead things to new life. If we see the world katasarka, we prefer our own way to God's way. We prefer revenge to reconciliation. We prefer anger to peace. We prefer holding grudges to forgiving. We prefer power to humility. But when we are able to see the world katanuma, we finally understand that the road to the kingdom of God is not marked by power or violence, but by grace and forgiveness and mercy and peace and above all else. This is so radical for Paul that once you see the world katanuma, he says there's no going back. This transformation is so all-encompassing that the old things must pass away. The more I study Paul, the more I appreciate him as a normal human being like you and me, mostly because I think Paul was just as scatterbrained as I am. He's a lot like a sloppy genius. Many places in his letters... It's clear that he's just kind of rambling off the top of his head, probably dictating to someone else to write down. And then he has to go back and change and correct something that he just set up here. It's, it's like you can watch his brain work in real time. But this moment may be one of my favorite of Paul's kind of crazy moments. In verse 17, the Greek literally says, if anyone is in, new Christ, if anyone is in Christ... New creation. There's no verb in the sentence. Our English translations say, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. 
But translating it that way smooths out some of Paul's rough edges. He doesn't even wait long enough to put the verb in the sentence. He can't wait any longer. He just can't contain himself. If anyone is in Christ, new creation. Isn't that what seeing with different eyes is like? All of creation and ourselves included become a new creation. A landscape that can seem foreign and difficult to navigate. My favorite part of the video from earlier, it may have been hard to hear at times, but my favorite part is when his wife says, look at your kids' eyes. They're so pretty. That's my favorite part because he can't contain himself and he just like begins to break down looking at his kid's eyes and I'm a blubbering mess at that point in the video. But my second favorite part of the video was quieter and harder to hear. He sits down on the step and he says, that's super overwhelming. And he takes the glasses off. The invitation to see things katanuma does not come easily be very overwhelming to see things in a new way. We will constantly be tempted to look at the beauty of this new creation, katanuma, and instead of accepting it, we will be tempted to just take the glasses off. I mean, it is very overwhelming to see the world differently. Maybe it's just easier to go back to the old way. Maybe love isn't worth it after all. If we learn anything this Lenten season, let it be that Jesus thought love was worth it. Jesus thought love was dying, was worth dying for. Jesus thought you were worth dying for. And through his death, what happened? New creation. It's always easier to go back to the way things were before. However, we are called to a higher calling. We are called to leave the ways of the flesh behind and instead to see the world with the eyes of the spirit. It won't be easy, but it will be fulfilling. It will be glorifying. It will be worth it. Friends, this week, put your new glasses on and have the courage to not take them off. Thanks for
say a word of prayer, but it's more about you. Okay. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together, the opportunity to fellowship with one another and grow closer to one another and closer to you. And this time, God, we ask that you bless our fellowship and our conversation. We ask that you help us to remember that in all things, we are glorifying you. God, bless this food that we're about to eat. May it nourish and strengthen our bodies so that we can be set apart for your service. And God, bless those who work so hard to prepare this meal for us. God, we are so thankful for all that you do for us. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody say, Katanuma. As you go this week, see the world with new eyes. The eyes that only the Spirit can have. And friends, as you leave this place, let love be true. Return no person evil for evil, but hold fast to all that is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, give to all those in need. Show only love and compassion to all people. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit go with us all. Now and forever. Amen.